Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of What to Think, VentureBeat's technology news podcast. Today's episode is part of our Innovation Engines series, sponsored by Pivotal Tracker. And today's guest is David Wadwani. He's the CEO and president of AppDynamics. We uh, spoke to him actually in December. He's brand new CEO of the company at that time, having just joined from Adobe. But first, Jordan Novet and I have some news for you. How you doing, Jordan? I'm doing well, Dylan. How are you? I'm really well. I'm kind of getting into the rhythm of the year now that CES is over and starting to look forward to what's going on in the in the coming year. Yeah, I, I guess I am sort of into that area. Today is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and it was raining really hard yesterday here in San Francisco, and things just feel odd, so it, it feels new, I guess I could say. I, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what happens this year and how it'll be different from last year. Well... There's been a lot of talk lately about what I call the end of the unicorn party. Yeah. <laughs> John Swartz did a piece in USA Today just a couple of days ago about how lofty valuations leading to many billion dollar companies have started really to come back to earth. Startups are finding it harder to raise money and we expect, uh, uh, well, he expects and the people he's talked to. And I have to say, a lot of the VCs that I've talked to as well fundraising will be harder and uh, and the unicorn herd will be thinner as they say does that line up with what you're hearing too jordan yeah he mentions mix panel in his story mm -hmm. and i was the one to break the news about mix panel having some layoffs they have more than 230 employees and they just laid off about 20 of them mm -hmm. mostly in sales and when i talked to the ceo he of course, didn't want to make it out to be a bubble bursting kind of story. Right. But he did acknowledge that they might have hired too many people. And even that admission is enough for me to hang my hat on some kind of trend. It's not as big and huge and epic and massive and giant as maybe people thought it was uh, at that company. Right. Uh, they had to roll back a little bit, that's all. And so you have other companies doing this. Instacart is another one mm -hmm. that is mentioned in the story. I saw that article that Recode had breaking the news. And then shortly after that, within like a half hour, I was just checking out the Instacart blog. And I noticed that they said they're <laughs> raising their prices for deliveries of groceries. And I said, well, gosh, that's interesting. They could really use a little bit more revenue, apparently, and they need to cut their expenses a little bit. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm seeing this more and more. He's absolutely right that there are more challenging circumstances right now. The investors apparently want more. A year ago, you would have these same investors would have, and same entrepreneurs, for that matter, would have poo-pooed any any reference to revenues, let alone profits. I mean, the, the, the mantra when times are good, at least on the VC fundraising front, is that revenues don't matter. We need to build the market, right? You need to build the audience and, and get customers and mm -hmm. worry about making money from them later because you have to dominate the market first and then figure out how to monetize it. Kind of a different tune that they're singing now. Well, once you're a billionaire, more's on the line. I feel like they, they have just greater <laughs> expectations now. That is probably true. There's some global economic factors that are contributing to this, too. The stock market in China is tanking. Oil prices are incredibly low. That's bringing U.S. stock market down. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has happened is, for instance, with Snapchat, when you mm -hmm. have money that's not typically invested in uh, startups like Fidelity, Right. Uh, these big equity investments, they're going to adjust their perception of the valuation of the company every quarter. And it's not always going to go up. And so in a way, <laughs> once you take investment from somebody like that, you're almost public because your valuation gets reassessed every quarter. And that mm. can be a little challenging for some of these unicorns. It, it definitely is happening on a greater scale now yeah. that they are making disclosures about their own equity holdings it's true yeah. but uh foursquare is another one where last week they confirmed they took on more money in funding and it just happens to be that their valuation was cut in half mm -hmm. and another one that we should mention is guilt group that yes. just got acquired so by the Saks fifth avenue part uh owner yeah hudson's bay yes. the fascinating number is that the deal went for 250 million yes but yes. their most recent funding round for the startup was 280 so clear discrepancy. It's fascinating. 
It's never good when your exit valuation is lower than the amount of money that you've raised to date. That's really not good. Okay, so, so Dylan, I'm going to take this opportunity, though, to just poke you a little bit and say, do you think the bubble will burst this year? Yes or no? It depends on your definition of burst, but yes. I think it's actually in the process of deflating right now. And okay, there we have it. I, I think you're, you're right. The, the, there are indications. Something is happening. I agree. Yeah, totally. So let's move on to uh, advertising and content. There's one interesting thing that I noted just last week, coverage on VentureBeat of Apple shutting down its iAd network, which I think, honestly, uh, iAd has not done that well, but I'm surprised that they're walking away from it entirely. It's been around for just a few years, and you know, it's not a huge line item on their earnings reports quarter after quarter. We don't really have any idea of exactly how much money this is generating for Apple, but it's fair to say that it's not their biggest moneymaker in profit or even just in terms of how much revenue it's bringing in. You know, you combine this with the news from last year where Apple began supporting ad blocking in iOS. You might think that Apple was actually really not only not dependent on the advertising industry or the advertising ecosystem, but actually actively wanted to hurt it because, after all, that's what Google, one of its biggest competitors, is dependent on. It's interesting to talk about Apple's move away from ads when you think about what other companies are doing. And so Facebook, which is a huge company in in terms of mobile ads, has their instant articles. And then Google, which is growing probably in the mobile ad area, has its own answer to it, the Accelerated Mobile Pages Project. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know how to characterize this sort of complex dance that Google in in particular is doing with not only advertisers, but publishers. What are they trying to gain? It it seems like they don't want people to experience these awful ad units. I think it's the user experience, honestly. First of all, that's why Facebook's instant articles even exist. That's why Apple is giving the green light to ad blockers because the mobile web sucks right now, Jordan. It's just (laughs) terrible. Unfortunately, I have to include VentureBeat in that blanket statement because, you know, every time you go to a website Mm -hmm. supported by advertising, you're reading it for about five seconds and then an ad pops up that blocks everything out. Pages are slowed down. The experience is terrible. Things are always taking over your screen. It's unpleasant. You know, Facebook and Apple each had their own answers to this. And I think Google is seeing the writing on the wall and they're saying, fine, we're going to provide a way for mobile web pages to perform better. And by the way, as part of that process with AMP, we are going to exert more control over the advertising ecosystem. And I say bring it on because fundamentally the technology is not broken. It's just that what publishers and advertisers have done with it is broken Mm -hmm. in terms Mm -hmm. of the mobile web. We'll see what that means for the consumer experience of the mobile web on iPhones in the future. I don't know what to expect now now that Apple is kind of stepping away from the ad business. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think Apple's probably going to continue pushing apps as opposed to ads, and Google is going to try to make the mobile web more attractive. I really know, don't know where all this is going to shake out, but I am very, very pleased to see some of these industry titans taking on the state of mobile publishing and mobile advertising. Yeah, they care more. That's yeah. what it feels like. I, I was at a, a, an AMP event from Google, and there were many publishers sitting at the table. There were a f- few people representing advertising companies there. And I felt something controversial, important, something unprecedented happening. I can't put my finger on it yet, but I think it is something that we'll be talking about for for years to come, for sure. I think you're right. Now, let's talk about Oculus. You, in the last couple of weeks, built a PC. So you can play <laughs> with the Oculus Rift. Tell me about that, I Jordan. sure did. It is now sitting at VentureBeat's office, but I did it here at home, and I basically went to Fry's Electronics in San Jose, yes. one of the locations, and I got all of the things that I needed after doing a lot of research and talking with different people about what I should get. And I spent more than I would have liked, to be frank. <laughs> but 1400 is that right? 1400 or so. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and, Jordan, I just yeah. have to stop you right there. The last time yeah. I built a PC was in, I don't know, the mid-90s or something. Sounds about right. Okay. So uh-huh. why do you feel the need to build a PC from scratch for Oculus? Well, I think I can't have a better excuse than that the Oculus Rift, the biggest VR launch in a long time, 
can't run on Mac. And I have a MacBook Air. I have old Macs that uh, also still barely work, but I can't do virtual reality or at least Oculus virtual reality on those computers. They just won't be supported in in the near future by Facebook with Oculus. And so I don't want to buy a computer that exists. That's boring. I've always wanted a good excuse or I, I've wanted to, to build it, and this is a good excuse. There you and go. And so I'm just going ahead with it, and I'm loving it. I feel so proud turning on that thing every time. It feels, like, exciting. I feel connected to it, and I know all the elements inside of that box. It is a good experience to understand the components that make up a PC and to understand that you can actually put it together and, and have it work at the end of the day. I think it gives you some geek cred, too, Jordan. I, I, I find that oh, yeah. I'm, I'm taking you a little more seriously now than I, than I did before this happened. Oh, yes. I know all the parts in that computer, Dylan. I know how they all work. All right. Well, <laughs> when, uh, when my USB stops working, I'm going to come to you and ask you to help me debug it. Yeah, but maybe I should start charging a fee or something. So it's 1400 bucks, and then it's basically 700 bucks with the <laughs> Oculus Rift. So I put down a lot of money to do this, Dylan. If you want you know, some kind of customer service, you're going to have to pay up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll go back to debugging my own electronics. Before we go to our guest, I'm going to uh, take a minute to thank our sponsor. The What to Think Innovation Engine podcast series is brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. It's an agile tool. It's been organizing software teams since 2006 with a drag and drop interface and a structured workflow that works for developers, product managers, and designers so they can build and better manage software one story at a time. You can go to pivotaltracker.com and sign up for a 30 day free trial right now. Now I'd like to introduce AppDynamics CEO David Wadwani. David, thanks for joining the VentureBeat podcast. Thanks for having, having me, Dylan. So you have been here, well, as we're recording this, yeah. a grand total of maybe two months. Two and a half. I'm an industry veteran at this company at okay. this point. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you came at a pretty auspicious time for AppDynamics. The right. company recently closed, a, I think, $158 million round. That's right, yes. The people are saying the valuation is close to $2 billion. We're not commenting on that, but certainly uh, I've seen reports to that effect. Okay. Reuters was reporting 1.9. We'll go with that for now, unconfirmed. Welcome to the Unicorn Club, I guess. I'm not a huge fan of, of that moniker. You know, I'm, I'm, I believe you know, each company has, uh, has an individual style and, and uh, an approach to the market. And uh, you know, I think it's a good shorthand to try and create these groups or cohorts of companies. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of what you know, AppDynamics have, has done. I think the the recent financing actually made a big difference in terms mm. of giving people the context of how valuable this company really is, mm-hmm. especially given the climate in which we raised it. Mm-hmm. Um, I just like the fact that, that we stand, as, stand alone as a company. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah. I think it's people sort of naturally latch onto yeah. the billion dollar number because Absolutely. it's nice and round and yeah. it's like, congratulations, you've done very well. There are only 50 or 100 companies that have made it that far and are right. still privately held, right? Right, so, right. Although the number does seem to be growing. Does this mean that an IPO is in the offing, or are you going to be one of these companies that sort of stays private and just continues to raise money? Just to be clear, I was brought into this company to take it public, and that's mm-hmm. exactly what I, I intend to do. The financing that uh, around the $158 million that you, you referred to was one that allows us to invest in a couple key areas, mm-hmm. and more importantly, gives us the freedom to pick the timing uh, of our choice in terms of when we, when we go public. Okay. The key element in terms of how we run the business, though, is a business that is already being run as a business that's focused on top line growth, but also very respectful of the need to drive increasing leverage year after year, quarter after quarter. Mm -hmm. So we are already, in my mind, operating as a public company, and the intention is very much to go public at some point in the near future. Okay, so tell me about the timing. What's the climate look like right now? We're not talking about when we will go uh, go public. But generally speaking. Yeah, in general, from what uh, the conversations that, that I've been having there's obviously been a slowdown in terms of companies that have gone public. I believe, based on what I see and the conversations that I've had, is that the first half of next year might also be generally slow. You're talking uh, 2016. Uh, 2016, right? yes. It mm-hmm. uh, might be generally slow. But then, because there's been a general correction in terms of private market valuations, at some point there are a number of companies uh, that are going to need to raise. 
And Wait, private market valuations are correcting now? Yeah, I think that uh, about two or three months ago, I believe that there was a notable change in terms of private valuations that, in my mind, is much more in line with public valuations at this point. Okay. Whereas a few months ago, it wasn't the case. Right? Yeah, it was totally out of control. It, it, I mean, there are still some out of control. I mean, who knows if Uber is really worth $70 billion, but... There are two reasons that the valuations of private companies are out of control. One is there was, I think, irrational exuberance in terms of how investors were looking to get in on some of these uh, potentially future growth opportunities yeah. and maybe overpaying for some of that. And then the second thing are these ratchet clauses that are getting a little bit more attention, mm. where a lot of companies were getting significantly higher valuations, but they were in return giving investors complete downside protection if right. the IPO was below that. And so the investor's like, I don't care if you're worth $25 billion, I'm going to, even if you you go down from that point, I'm still going to make money. There's, there's a lot of protection there for yeah. those investors. And I think those things are starting to give a lot of these privately held companies that had this sense of free run on private side valuations a very different view of the market next year. I think you'll see the first half be much quieter than you saw the first half in 2015. Mm -hmm. But then in the back half of 20, uh, 2016, my view is that a lot of companies that would have done private round financing are probably going to find the public markets just as appealing um, okay. as, and, and obviously offering some liquidity. Do you see a differentiation between enterprise and other kinds of companies? I mean, as an enterprise company. In general, I think each company is going to have its own fundamentals. And, and I think from an uh, investor perspective, what I personally liked about AppDynamics and why I came here was because it was in the enterprise space. And there's mm -hmm. a lot more predictability in my mind as to how enterprise class companies actually, not just once they hit a skip velocity, start to continue to grow their the business, but there's much more of a, I think, a predictable formula for how you drive leverage and efficiency mm. into the business as you're growing too. So my personal uh, belief is that you know a, a well-run uh, enterprise software company has, has a lot of potential uh, in, in 2016 to stand out. Okay. So let's talk about AppDynamics and what it does and what attracted you to AppDynamics to, you know, to run it as CEO. You're an application performance monitoring company. Is that a fair summary? Like you, you help companies figure out what their apps are doing. Absolutely, yes. Okay. So in that sense, you compete with New Relic and there are many other others in this space. Yes. Uh, what, what makes you guys different? I look at the APM or application performance monitoring moniker. It's a very convenient one for us to, uh, to attach to right now because there's general awareness of, of what that mm -hmm. is. I actually look at, look at what we do at AppDynamics as a much bigger platform for having a, uh, an impact in, in the business. Where I see the opportunities is, is that there are numbers of companies going through this idea of digital transformation. They used to do a business a particular way in the past. They're now doing a, a business in a much more forward-looking way, much more digital. Um, more, more quantified, more, more data-driven, more, more analytic. Data, and, more, and more over software and through applications. And that transition that they're going through more business is being transacted through uh, software and through applications, and that's where we come in, and we're going to help ensure that they have visibility into, into those systems. Mm -hmm. So getting back to your question, yes, APM is a, is a category that's convenient for us. New Relic is in this, and there are some uh, a number of legacy players. Mm -hmm. um, New Relic uh, is more of an SMB player. We play uh, squarely in the enterprise space. If you look at our customers, they're the world's largest banks, they're the world's largest retailers, they're the mm -hmm. world's largest healthcare, mm -hmm. they're significant sized government agencies, and we play in a very significant role in their stack. What makes you particularly appealing to banks? And From the very beginning, our founder, Jyoti Bansal, as he started the company, he went directly after solving the needs of these larger organizations as they were looking at going through this digital transformation. Mm -hmm. And so as more and more of their business is transacted through software, there's a, a significant need for them to make sure that that software is working. Right. The issue that larger enterprises or enterprises in general face is that while they're writing all of this new code and de delivering, deploying all these new applications, those applications work in an incredibly complex, heterogeneous backend, mm -hmm. right? Some of it's going to be running in AWS or Azure or some cloud-hosted facility. Some of it's going to be in a private cloud. Some of it's going to be in a co-location. Some of it's going to be on-prem. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Jyoti and the team here recognized from the very beginning was that the code that we built for that, for the uh, application performance monitoring space here, had to work in these heterogeneous environments. We have a technology called Tag and Follow, which will turn on the lights for an application stack in these enterprises, 
regardless of where the, the back end is being called. And a lot of our customers... So you're able to deploy monitoring code across a heterogeneous stack all at the same time? Is it, that what you're saying? That's exactly right. And, and it, it's, it's like magic. The first time some of these customers turn on AppDynamics in their environments, you can see the light bulbs going on. You, you'll actually see developers and operations folks or these new DevOps uh, roles that are being formed look at it and they'll actually start arguing or they'll tell us there's a bug in the, in the code because we know our login uh, application interfaces do not rely on this backend database. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as they dig in further, they realize, of course, there's not a bug in our code. Oh my God, they didn't realize that that con connection was there. <laughs> and it's a, it's, a huge, it's a huge opportunity for them to really, for the first time, understand how this is happening mm. uh, and, and how things are running. Because as you know, more and more of the world is moving to agile development. More and more of it is embracing this idea of continuous de uh, deployment. And as a result, more microarchitectures are being built up. So you've got developers working on a particular piece of the puzzle, mm -hmm. but maybe never really understanding all of the interactions before and after the piece that they're working on. Right. That's what we do. Okay. So what, what you're saying is like the, this sort of world where you've got microarchitectures and little teams creating little things that suddenly turn out to be critical or get widely used and widely deployed and then the team is fragmented or something and organizational changes happen and then nobody knows what's plugged into where and what's, I mean, that's sort of an IT architect's nightmare, right? You can call it the, the their nightmare or you can call it their reality. Their reality, their and, living nightmare, uh, yes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And this is one of those things. And uh, we were talking earlier about my time at Adobe. Yes, which uh, I want to ask you more about, absolutely. So a little bit of background there. I took over the digital media business at Adobe six years ago. Mm -hmm. The business at that time was about $3 billion, uh, you know, the largest revenue stream at Adobe, but it was also growing very slowly. Worse, as we started to dig under the covers, we started to realize that while the business was growing single digits, the growth was really coming from an, uh, increasing the average selling price mm -hmm. and the number of so users. You're talking about Photoshop and InDesign. You're just exactly. jacking the price up. Exactly. That, that's what we were, exactly. That's what we were doing six years ago. And what I realized as we were looking at the business uh, was the market context had gotten much better, not worse, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mobile was coming on, more photos were being taken, mm -hmm. more videos were being edited and published and viewed than ever before. So something just didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. And as we looked at a number of different things, we realized really what we were doing was we were doing business wrong. The technology was still as wonderful and, and impressive as it ever was, mm -hmm. but the business context had changed on us. People didn't want to buy a product that got updated every 18 months. They didn't want to go into a store and pay $2,500 or $800. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They wanted to subscribe to a living, breathing service that was ongoing, that was about the, the, the tools, but it was also about the community. Mm -hmm. And so we embarked on a, a very significant journey to uh, introduce something called Creative Cloud. Uh, right. That happened three and a half years ago. The change there was we moved the business model from these upfront perpetual prices to anywhere from $10 to $50 a month in terms of subscription fees. Mm -hmm. And we started giving people updates more regularly. We gave them value across mobile, desktop, web, an integrated cloud service with community, uh, and a digital marketplace for buying and selling goods, all of this, this into one place. Mm -hmm. uh, and the business skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the market cap of the company back six years ago was maybe a quarter or maybe a fifth of what it is today. And today they're wow. enjoying a $45 billion market cap. Right, it seemed co sort of controversial at first. People were like, what, you're gonna, you can have my copy of Photoshop when you claw it from my fingers, right? It was a very controversial move yes. at, at the time. And but you're saying it actually paid off well for Adobe. Hugely, and, 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 and let me be clear, I, I don't think it paid off well just for Adobe. It paid off well for our customers. And the reality is our customers have a lot more power at their hands now. Mm -hmm. They can access Photoshop on not just their desktop, but they can access Photoshop on mobile devices. Yeah. They can access more community members to help them with things. They can actually use Creative Cloud to sell goods and actually make money through Adobe Stock, which is now an integrated part of mm -hmm. what they did. So the, the core fundamental point here is that that transition that uh, the company made from doing business the old way to doing business the new way, while there was some controversy, while there was some difficulty in making that transition, was good for the customer. We have more people now buying uh, mm. or subscribing to Creative Cloud than ever bought the products in the past. Interesting. And so user growth is there, revenue growth is there. 
and user satisfaction is through the roof. Adobe is a much older company than Aptynamics. Mm -hmm. do, does Aptynamics need to make a similar kind of shift, or is there what, what lessons do you draw? So the lessons I draw from that are, are twofold. One is that the digital transformation that Adobe went through needs to be emulated and, and uh, gone through by thousands of other companies. Mm -hmm. uh, literally, any company out there that has uh, is of any scale needs to start thinking about how they're going to do business over software and through services and applications. So mm -hmm. that transition is one that is going to happen on a very regular basis. Mm -hmm. And you're already seeing companies do it. It's only going to accelerate. The second thing is that the team that's under the most stress in that context of that digital transformation, in my mind, is IT. Mm -hmm. Because everything that used to have an offline equivalent of, of business function mm -hmm. is now funneling itself through IT because as software and as applications become the place where business is transacted, the right. IT organization has to step up and find ways to support that. Increasingly, they're not in the driver's seat about those technology decisions either. They're mm -hmm. being asked to implement things that other people have decided about. And right. both that and they're being asked to do it fast. Yeah. <laughs> and so what that leads to is a stability issue as they start to go through these things. And, and today, if you're down mm -hmm. and your competitors are not down, they're a click away. Yeah. And you may, you may lose your customers on a permanent basis. So you're talking about helping AppDynamics customers do the same thing that that's, Adobe did. That's exactly right. I okay. mean, AppDynamics doesn't need to go through a transition. It's mm. a, we're still a relatively young company yeah. in a space that I think is, is massive. Our goal is very single-minded, which is to help the thousands of enterprise customers out there that need to go through that digital transformation go through it. And our audience is very focused, which is it's the IT organization, the ops teams in those organizations or the DevOps teams mm -hmm. that have to run these systems at scale, make sure they're functioning, make sure the company's open for business. Okay. That's what we do. So you're not necessarily developer focused or you're less developer focused than, than say some of the competitors. You're more IT and operations. IT and operations focused and DevOps where it is. It, whoever is interested in running the systems for the company, we are seeing more and more developers come into the system and actually not just write the code, yeah. but actually deploy and manage the code. Yeah, yes. Definitely part of the, the, the key. But the people that are doing the operations in the company, whether it's a developer or whether it's an IT, traditional IT ops person, that's our audience. Who's usually making the buying decision? It's an interesting motion. Um, so when we go in and we sell in, into a company. You do have a free trial, I, I know we do. this too, by the way, right? We, so you, the motion works in a fairly standard way, which is, which is very efficient for us. The initial purchase will almost always be made by a practitioner. So a DevOps person or an IT ops person that is looking at this and saying, these systems are so important, I need to, I need to make sure they're good. They'll find us on the website, they will have heard about us somehow, and they'll just start using the system. Mm -hmm. We'll talk to them and we'll make the initial purchase. Once we make that purchase, the expansion happens so quickly because we go in fast, that's one thing. The second thing is unlike the, the older, older do you, vendors. Do you mean you implement fast or do you mean the sales team descends quickly? I meant the DevOps person <laughs> or the, I should choose my words carefully. <laughs> The, the, See a small army of like Oracle style salespeople. No, okay. it's a very different model. You, you, meant, you meant implement fast. We, exactly. Okay. We, we, uh, the, the DevOps person implements us fast. We go in very easily. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the wonderful things we do is we don't ask them to tell us and instrument the code. We just put the agents in there and the agents will automatically learn what is normal behavior mm -hmm. uh, in the system. So something, the way it looks on Monday morning, versus Tuesday evening, versus Thursday midday, mm -hmm. there's gonna be variability in terms of how the systems function. Mm -hmm. And so within hours or within days, they're running in production at an at-scale environment. So there's a lot of excitement that comes up and we turn that initial trial into a advocate very quickly. Okay. Once that happens, we start spreading within the organization yeah. very quickly. The CIO learns about us and gets on the phone with us, and we love it when that happens because mm -hmm. that drives expansion in the accounts. It's a traditional land and expand model. Yeah. The land is the practitioner, mm -hmm. the expansion is the practitioner turning into an advocate, and the CIO getting involved. Got it. You guys have partnered with a lot of the major players in the, in the cloud space, like Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure, I noticed even Red Hat. Um, so how, how important are partnerships like that in, in the landscape of APM. Very important. First of all, what people are looking for is uh, easy deployment. They want to get up and running very quickly in AWS and, and Azure and, and sort of the new cloud models. We also support very quick getting up and running on-prem. So that's been an area of collaboration for us and different system le level vendors. The second thing that we're starting to see is interest in terms of our data. 
Hmm. So the thing to, to note is that uh, as people are starting to deploy our agents, we're collecting data in terms of the utilization of the applications mm -hmm. that start to, to give very important uh, information about whether it's business transactions or whether it's application health that can be used by other technology vendors. So mm -hmm. I think what you'll also see in addition to this initial round of partnerships relative to ease of deployment and maintainability, you'll see us do more and more announcements in the future around how the data here can actually help those systems run more efficiently uh, and, and benefit in terms of their own health check. Okay, so you're built on top of these platforms, but in a sense you are also looking towards a future where you might be extensible by either returning some of that data back to those platforms or to analytics tools of various flavors. Absolutely, you, right? absolutely. We have some very rich data and openness is the game, and I think a lot of our customers want to be able to leverage the data that we have to combine it with other systems and, and improve their overall efficiency. What, what does openness mean in your context? Is that you have an API or does that mean the customer owns the data and they can do whatever they want? We believe that the customer should call the shots on how they want to use this. We do and will continue to have API access to our data. Two is we have hundreds of extensions that mm -hmm. are written on top of the AppDynamics platform already. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, our deployment options are unique. As a customer, you can basically decide to buy AppDynamics and you can decide to deploy it on SaaS. Mm -hmm. You can buy AppDynamics and decide to deploy it on-prem, where you actually maintain complete control over your data. Because of the way it was architected from the very beginning, customers can go back and forth too. So we believe very strongly that our customers should make the decisions that are right for them, and at the moment, that's right for them. Okay. We're running towards the end of our time, but I'd love to hear some examples of how customers have used AppDynamics. I've been here for two and a half months. The number of customer visits I've had has been probably the most exhilarating thing about spending time here, and the customer relationships have been fantastic. I'll give you a couple examples. My second day on the job here, we had the CEO of a major retail bank come and sit down and spend time with us. He was telling me about this outage that they had a week ago that was very difficult. It was a nine hour outage. Some of the core services that you would expect from a retail bank that were down. Mm -hmm. Luckily, we had deployed in freemium app dynamics into the system and hadn't been operationalized yet. Our reps went in the next day and they asked us to look at the system and see what we could do to, to figure out what went wrong the, the previous day. And literally from the time they logged in, to the time they found the offending line of code that took them seven hours the day before to, to solve. We found it in less than a minute. You and know, that's a significant enough difference to get the CEO's attention. He was looking at this and saying, you're covering less than 10% of my application stack today. What do I have to do to get do business with you to cover my entire application stack? Because I don't know where the next outage is going to come from. Yeah. And so that's a really powerful place. We not only work in these contexts in terms of cost reduction, but that outage is a revenue impact. That outage is a brand mm -hmm. uh, impact to this organization, and our ability to help them on both of those vectors is, is really clear. And to your point, it's getting CEO level attention because this is digital transformation. Right. In the old days, IT was that organization that would you know, keep the systems running. Today, IT or is the organization that is running your business. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing more CEOs get involved in these conversations. A couple other examples that I love, the largest railroad in uh, North America. They have over 2,000 developers today. They themselves are going through their digital transformation mm -hmm. where they're running all of their, their trains and their systems online. That's a, another example. Tesla is a customer, so we're seeing very active use in the automotive space as well. As we look at this, the customer examples are very consistent with what I just shared you on a point-by-point -point basis, but the broad swath of interest and us usage of this cuts through all of those industry verticals. Literally, I believe, if you ask yourself the simple question, five years from now, is there gonna be any at-scale business that doesn't transact the majority of their business through software, through applications? I think the answer is, of course, everyone's gonna be doing that. Right, and when that happens, who's gonna be making sure that they're open for business? That's what we do. Okay. Well, it sounds like you have landed in a very interesting spot at a very interesting time. We'll look forward to um keeping in touch with you and keeping an eye on what AppDynamics is up to in the coming year. I'd like that a lot. Cool. Thank you Great. very much for Th your time, David. Thank you, Dylan. Well, that's it for What to Think, VentureBeat's technology news podcast. As always, you can find us online at VentureBeat.com in both mobile and desktop forms. And you can also find us in the iTunes Music Store and on SoundCloud. Just search for What to Think. Thank you.